Good afternoon and welcome to this joint Corelight and Splunk webinar. Uh, I would like to uh, remind you if you have questions, could you please put them in the question window uh, on your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, we will be answering these as the webinar progresses and uh, any longer questions that need discussion, we'll save to the end and uh, have the forum uh, and the presenters deal with those questions at that time. So with no further ado, I would like to hand you over to Basil Shahin. Thank you, Anton, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Basil Shahin, and uh, I manage Corelight uh, for the Middle East, Turkey, and Africa. We have a very exciting webinar for everyone today, um, some very experienced folks on the call. Uh, Luis Ferreira is the Senior Sales Engineer from Splunk for the Middle East. Uh, Farhan Khan is the Senior Sales Engineer for Corelight in the Middle East. And we also have Damian Murphy, who's the Senior uh, SC Director at EMEA for Corelight. Um, so we're just going to go over the agenda for today. Um, so threat hunting versus incident response, what is this all about? Uh, we're going to go through what are the threat hunting models that uh, we see. Um, what does the next generation SOC stack look like? And then obviously go into the Open NDR platform and why Corelight and Splunk. Now, we're going to also do a very exciting demo, which will showcase uh, the technologies uh, working hand in hand, uh, as well as uh, a follow up with some useful resources, uh, including a very important threat hunting guide and a couple of others that we will share in the chat. And of course, we'll be able to take all of the questions that uh, weren't answered during the call. So, again, just a reminder to everybody that uh, to drop your questions in the questions uh, window, not in the chat window. And that way our uh, teams will be able to answer them for you during the call. With that, I'll pass it over to Luis Ferreira, Ferreira for the first section. Thanks, Basil. And hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this webinar. Um, so what exactly is threat hunting and what's behind it? Despite all the investments in security throughout the past years, um, we have to realize that eventually all these investments, for example, in security detection tools or even uh, in human resources, all these investments are going to fail. And that's why threat hunting becomes paramount in modern SOCs. Threat hunting, per definition, is the process of searching for threats that have potentially gone undetected and are currently hiding on the, on the network in order to prevent further damage. How does threat hunting relate with incident response? Let's look at these two pictures in the slide to contrast them. On the left, we have a man and his dog and his shotgun going out into a field. He has something in mind, he is hunting for something specific. He may find it, he may not, but he's going out and looking for it. On the right, we have a house that looked like it had a bad night. If that was my house, I would be asking the who, what, well, in this case, we know the what and the where, but we don't know when, why, or possibly the how. As an incident responder, the picture on the right is what your day may start like and the questions you are trying to answer tied to that picture. It's fair to say that incident response is a more reactive approach to respond to threats that were already found and threat hunting is a proactive approach that might trigger incident response depending on what is found. For example, in case something suspicious or malicious is detected. So we can consider hunting as part of the incident response process as represented in this pyramid. The incident response hierarchy of needs that you see on the slide describes the capabilities that organizations must build to defend their business assets. The bottom capabilities are prerequisites for successful execution of the capabilities above them. So we can kind of look at this pyramid as a kind of maturity model that can be applied to, to, to hunting as well. Because hunting is a nice buzzword and, and a really trendy and hot topic, there's a lot of people that come and say, hey, I want to start hunting. And the only data sources they have available are basically the firewall and the Windows event logs, for example, which is simply not enough. So really, uh, they don't have the business context, visibility or telemetry needed to actually be able to properly hunt. So 
it's important to have some of these basic security fundamentals in place. And that's why I strongly advise organizations to follow this simple model to understand where they, where they are in terms of maturity and how they can follow a journey to increase the maturity level and start thinking about hunting. I also wanted to highlight that having a red team skill set um, is very important for threat hunting in the sense that you want to, to simulate the threats that might affect your business and evaluate if your SOC detection mechanisms, either tools of people, are working properly to detect those. In case you don't have a red team in place um, for smaller organizations, you can use attacker simulations tools like uh, the Atomic Red Team. I wanted to share with you guys a quote that came from an excellent book called Intelligence Driven Incident Response. Um, hunting really relies on this combination of instinct, experience, and good data. Take the picture of our hunter with the dog from a, from a few slides back. If he goes into a field with his dog and his gun, but he is hunting an elephant, that might not be the right place, right? The right gun? or the right animal to assist with that kind of hunt. On the other hand, an informed hunter who goes in that, into that space with that gun and that dog may be looking to hunt birds, which may be the perfect scenario. So having that knowledge and applying it to your hunt is really key to success. So how do we start hunting and what to hunt for? This question takes me to another pyramid. This time, uh, uh, um, uh, this pyramid illustrates the challenges and value of hunting attackers' TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures. We can, stay, we can say that the stuff at the bottom of the pyramid is the low-hanging fruit. It is quick and easy to check for, for example, a hash or even an IP, but it can also have very limited value. If we focus our mindset on, on the adversary perspective, we realize uh, very easily that it's trivial to change the value of a hash or, or an IP in case uh, uh, one of these indicators is discovered and blocked. So the further up the stack that you identify an adversary, the payback will be greater because it gets much more difficult for the adversary to change their TTPs upon being discovered and you can operationalize them and understand what to continually look for. So that's where the hunting focus should be. The downside of this approach is that it's really tough to uncover the adversary's TTPs. And this is where the Maitri attack framework can come into play to, to, to help us. As most of you know, the Maitri attack uh, is a global knowledge base of adversary tactics and techniques based on uh, real-world threat observations. It contains not only the TTPs, but also associates the TTPs with known APT groups. This enables organizations to focus their attentions on specific APT groups that are known to affect, for example, their specific industry. The MITRE, it's really highly recommended to support you in building your threat hunting hypothesis. To detect uh, advanced threats in your networks, many different data sets are required to be centralized for searching, analytics, and possibly for, for correlation as well. For example, the IDS and endpoint security technologies may or may not see specific attacks. So being able to have a diverse set of tools from host to network and from prevention to detection technologies is required for a better threat visibility. Being able to understand the context around the systems and users being protected is very important as well. And actually, uh, we have many customers using our Splunk Enterprise Security Solution that are applying that context uh, automatically to all the data ingested. For example, through uh, LDAP or CMDB automated queries. The main message here is that having this holistic view through one unique platform is what will make the difference in your hunting. And remember, it is not about the volume of the data you ingest, it's about the quality of the data. In fact, when we look at the incremental value of each data source for threat hunting, the industry has made great progress on the endpoint telemetry uh, with solutions like EDR. Nevertheless, 
not many organizations have yet invested in NDR, network detection and response, which is also a very hot and important tool, especially when we're talking about hunting and all the amazing insights it can give you, like, uh, for example, with Corelight, the encrypted traffic insights that you can use for hunting and that Mr. Farhan will, will cover later on the presentation. Okay, let's say we have the right telemetry. And now what? You need to centralize the data and uh, as I said before, you need to be able to contextualize, search, and correlate the data, both in the present, but also historically, which is also very important for hunting. Um, also, if possible, create some analytics around that data. This is where Splunk comes into the picture. Splunk is a data to everything analytics platform that can drive business outcomes for multiple use cases whether it is security, IT operations, DevOps, fraud analytics, et cetera, et cetera. As today we are focused on th security threat hunting, I wanted to share with you some considerations you should have when selecting your threat hunting platform. First, you need powerful searching capabilities to find a needle in the haystack. And Splunk Searching Language, the SPL, is a Google-like language that combines the best capabilities of SQL with a unique pipeline syntax, allowing you to rapidly explore massive amounts of machine data from different data sets and get valuable hunting insights. The second consideration would be uh, interoperability with the different sources of telemetry. And with Splunk, you can ingest any type of data in a very easy and flexible manner. Also, Splunk applies um, schema to the data at such time. We call it the schema on the fly. That gives you an abstraction layer when you are hunting across different data sets, at the same time leaving the raw format intact, for example, for forensic purpose. Another important topic is the, the, the scalability and high performance requirements. We have seen that the more quality data we have, the better for hunting. As you ingest more data to increase your coverage, you cannot compromise on your scalability and high performance requirements. Splunk not only doesn't have limits on these domains, but actually we have customers ingesting and searching across petabytes of data. Another important consideration is the benefits of having one unified platform for both threat hunting and analytics driven uh, SIM solution. What's really going to make your hunt worthwhile is if you can take uh, what you find in it and use it to improve your automated defenses. Using Splunk Core together with enterprise security as an analytics-driven scene, you can easily achieve that. The last two topics are the machine learning capabilities and also the automation. Splunk offers both supervised and unsupervised machine learning analytics with our UBA solution specific for user and entity behavior analysis, and also our free machine learning toolkit, which can also support your hunting. For example, uh, by providing you with analytics on, uh, on specific outliers or doing a, a, a threat anomaly detection. Last but not least, you need automation capabilities for hunting. Sometimes threat hunting can be a very repetitive process. And by using a security automation and orchestration response platform, a SOAR platform like Splunk Phantom, you can leverage out of the box threat hunting playbooks or create your own custom playbooks to automate threat hunting. Even though as a hunter, you should be creating your own uh, hunting hypothesis, it's always helpful when a tool can help you come up with where to begin a hunt. Splunk has different applications like the Splunk Security Essentials you see on the slide that provide out-of-the-box content that can help you build hunting hypothesis based on the Mitre attack framework or on other frameworks like the kill chain phases. And actually, we have many customers in the region and across the world leveraging it to be aligned with the Mitre. Before I finish this part of the presentation, the first part of the presentation, I, want to, I wanted to give you an idea of what the next generation security operations might look like. At Splunk, we look at cybersecurity operations through the lens of the OODA loop. 
which is a framework first used in the military. The idea being that whoever could execute through the OODA loop faster would win a battle. The same framework can be applied to cybersecurity. If we look from the left to the right, the acronym OODA stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. The products that help you do observations are things like firewalls, IPS, EDR, uh, or even NDR like CoreLight. They collect information and present that information to you uh, in order to help you understand what's happening in your environment. You then need to take those observations and apply some level of analytics in order to draw conclusions, see some trends, and get some context around the observations. This is the orient stage where usually the security alerts are generated and suspicious activity is detected. But then, for most security teams, it becomes a manual process. People need to make a decision based on the information they've gathered or make a decision based on the type of alert they received. And then they need to take an action, whether that's blocking an IP on a firewall, investigating malware further, um, performing some hunting, quarantining a device, etc. And SORT technology can solve these problems by increasing the speed of your security operations, which can help you execute through the OODA loop faster. Last but not least, as I've mentioned before, usually the incident response process is a more reactive approach, and there is no proactive threat hunting happening on organizations in parallel. So in order to achieve an next generation level, you need skilled hunters as part of the SOC team, and you need to perform blue team, red team simulation exercises to continuously test the detection performance of your SOC. I will now pass the mic to Mr. Farhan from CoreLight to walk us through some of their open NDR platform features and how it integrates with Splunk. Thank you so much, Louis. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about CoreLight's open NDR platform and what that means. Now, when we talk about the SOC, Gartner last year wrote this really nice paper about the visibility triad. And as Lewis was saying, it is very important for enterprises to have multiple sources of data so that they can have a better understanding of the sophistication of threats and adversaries that are attacking them. Now, Gartner took a high ground and said, in a SOC, there are three key components in that visibility triad. The SIM, of course, being the centerpiece and the EDR, which gives you really rich telemetry around the endpoint itself and the host data. But also, in order to have complete picture, enterprises also need to have network-based detections and NDR. And this NDR technology gives you entire visibility of what is happening in that network without the use of any agents. And I will not talk about the open NDR platform in detail. The open NDR platform from CoreLight comprises of three key components. The first of them is the alerts, insights, and our own behavior analytics. Now, what do we do here? CoreLight has provided not only signature, but also non-signature based alerts. But we also have packages that detect behavior within the environment and provide these as alerts. Now, we all know once you get an alert, the next thing to do is to investigate. And in the second component of investigation, this is where you, when you are investigating the alert, you will quickly pivot to Zeek based metadata. Now, Zeek, formerly known as Bro, has been around for over 25 years and it was created by the founders of CoreLight. Zeek provides high level of security context around metadata that makes it very easy to do incident response and is over 20 times faster than traditional incident response. At times, when the investigation is going on, you also need to do validation. Now, validation could mean you know, having visibility of the file that has been extracted. Validation could also mean looking at the relevant portions of a packet capture. And this completes the picture of the open NDR platform. And all of this can be directly visualized on the Splunk SIM. Now, looking at the components of our OpenNDR platform and why do we call it OpenNDR? 
So CoreLite's Open India platform consists of three key components. This is the Suricata based open source IDS and Zeek has been open source for over 25 years and CoreLite is the uh, commercial arm. Now looking at the modern security stack in the SOC, there is an associated concept called the design pattern. Open source Zeek, as I said, has been around for 25 years, has been deployed across multiple customers and CoreLite is the commercial arm where we can scale up to terabytes per second. We work with Splunk uh, in some of the biggest networks, uh, particularly in government, finance and mission critical infra infrastructures. One of the trends we have seen emerge is that a very defined design pattern and that pattern revolves around Splunk being the same, uh, Zeek uh, being used for network traffic analysis and Suricata being used for IDS and signature based alerts. What customers came to us and requested of Corelight was uh, to, to consolidate these network components in this modern security stack into a single appliance. And that is what we have done. So Corelight provides in a single sensor Suricara based IDS, Zeek based rich context of metadata, and also access into smart PCAP. Now, there are some institutions which are heavily regularized by compliance, like banking and financial institutions, that require packet captures. Corelight has moved ahead and created a smarter way to do packet capture, which helps in better indexing, better storage management, and it's just a better way of doing PCAP. Now, what do our logs look like? What does Zeek log look like? So Zeek generates dozens of logs and each log is tailored for a specific purpose. Uh, on the center of it is the con log or the connection log, as you can see on the screen. This provides connection visibility. Think of things like IP addresses, ports, bytes transferred, even the length of a connection. But most importantly, each connection or each con log is given a unique ID. The unique ID is basically used to correlate more detailed information about the connection in other logs. So let me give you an example. Let's say Lewis is going to a website. Let's say he's going to corelight.com. So in his connection log, we will have Lewis's IP address, his port number, and other details that come at layer three, layer four. But because he went to a website, he must have opened a browser. There must be DNS and domain resolution. Corelight will also include the same UID in other logs. Now maybe Lewis, while going through that website, actually downloaded a white paper. So there will also be a file-based log, which will also have the same UID. Now we know that most of the traffic these days is encrypted. Some say it is around 60 to 70% of traffic on the enterprise. Now Corelight also provides access into encrypted traffic with logs like SSL, X509 and SSH. Now, so far we have looked at IT, but Corelight as a, as a company can also look at OT-based protocols. Think of protocols like Modbus, Backnet, Profinet, etc., and they can also be visualized using Corelight. Having said that, if you want to have access into Microsoft-based protocols, we have Kerberos, RDP. Ones do you see on the screen are the most common ones. Having the access to these protocols is great, but Corelight goes a step ahead. We provide also alerts and insights into that data. Corelight has a notice log. A notice log is something that is used for alerting based on our behavioral detections and our packages. But we also have an Intel log, and the Intel log is basically a threat intelligence feed, which is looking at traffic as we go and is highlighting any alerts that it finds are bad. Now, Lewis was talking about the MITRE-based framework, and MITRE attack is, is a globally accessible knowledge base of you know, cyber adversary tactics and techniques. And it is extremely useful for understanding security risk against a known adversary behavior. And you can also plan security improvements, and, and it also helps in verifying that defenses work as expected. Now, Corelight has also included packages built in out of the box on the system that look at MITRE-based TTPs whether they could be starting from initial access or all the way to command and control or exfiltration. And these particular TTPs are highlighted in the notice log 
in Splunk so that it is easy for somebody who is in the SOC team doing incident response to just click on that link and look at what is happening. Now I spoke about the, the encrypted traffic and our logs early on, but I want to drill down into some details here. Now Corelight has, in, in last year, we included something called the encrypted traffic collection packages. Now, if you ask any SOC, a SOC member or any incident response analyst, they would always want to have Claytex data, but we know for a fact that that's not always going to happen. Sometimes there are compliances in place, sometimes there are policies in place, or sometimes encryption is something that is directed by the company itself. And encryption has a lot of challenges. So what we have done, we have taken a high ground uh, in giving visibility or insights into encrypted traffic without doing decryption. These are set of insights that are drawn from both Zeek uh, community and our research team. And they provide insights into encrypted traffic without decrypting so that the security analyst can tell you much more than what they could do early on. Here, we start with something simple, something simple like fingerprinting, where we fingerprint both SSL and SSH connections, J3 and hash. What we also do is we look into certificate hygienes. We monitor the SSL certificates, whether they are about to expire, self-signed, or have no certificate present. We also look into custom encryption. And this is important when you're doing threat hunting to see if some connections that you're, you're seeing over SSH are being used with custom encryption. We also look at expected and, and unexpected encryption. And let me give you an example for that. If we see traffic on port 443, it is understood that it has to be encrypted. But if Corelight understands it and says, you know what, we are seeing traffic on 443, but it is clear text. Now that might be a flag. It might be something benign, wherein the application itself is not doing what it's supposed to do. So Corelight can also be used, as I said earlier, to increase the efficacy of the existing solutions in place. Then we move into the risk part. And this is something that we all, uh, and I personally like it a lot because SSH as a protocol is used heavily within our enterprises, whether it is you know, logging into a switch or logging into a database that has a lot of critical data. Corelight, again, started with something easy. So we started looking at risk. Now, what would be a risk to the SSH? Maybe an attacker is scanning you for the SSH or for the virgin. Maybe once it has scanned the virgin, it is now trying to do brute force. Maybe the brute force was successful. Uh, maybe then he typed a few keystrokes or uploaded or downloaded a file. Corelight can detect all of that and it stitches that in, in a story so that it's easy for the analyst to, to see what is going on. Corelight can also look into reverse tunnels wherein let's say you access into SSH server and something else accesses back into you. Now that may not be normal behavior, but we can also look into that as it forms at its borderlines into something malicious. Now, we know Mozilla and Google have been pushing DNS over HTTPS for a while now, and that causes new challenges for our SOC teams. Corelight again has taken a high ground here where we have now packages that detect DNS over HTTPS as well and bring more visibility to our SOC teams. So why Corelight and, and, and Splunk? I'll let Basil Shaheen talk about it. And Basil, could you also explain why customers choose Corelight and Splunk together when they're looking to enhance their threat hunting and incident response postures? Yeah, sure, happy to do that. Um, so really what it comes down to with uh, with Corelight and Splunk is, is a few things. Number one, it's really easy to implement. So if you've already got Splunk, it's a 15 minute job. If you don't, um, obviously getting Splunk up and running uh, with their SaaS-based offerings as well as their on-prem is, is fairly straightforward and there's a lot of partners that can help uh, in the region. Uh, now what we've done is we've developed an app. So what that means is you use Corelight from within Splunk. So you're not having to pivot to multiple dashboards and multiple systems. You're actually using one system uh, to access everything. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've built out all of the L1 dashboards out of the box. So think about things like your alerts, your insights, your detections your log hunting, your DNS, your HTTP, your FTP. So all of these have been already built for you out of the box. So when it comes to threat hunting, you can, you, you know, you don't have to be an expert. You could start threat hunting from day one um, and you already have a ton of uh, available options that get you going, whether it's the alerts, the detections, or the actual dashboards that give you live or historical view of the context. 
The other uh, thing that's important is uh, to realize that this can be deployed anywhere. Um, if you've got a network that's sitting in the cloud, <clears throat> if you've got uh, a virtual network, or if you've got an on-prem uh, or, or uh, you know a hybrid environment, Core Light sensors and, and, and Splunk can can be anywhere. Uh, so we can we can deploy it uh, in the cloud. We can deploy it on-prem. Um, and the beauty about it is it's not intrusive, so it doesn't uh, disrupt your network. Um, it takes a, a mirror copy of your uh, network traffic using a tap, span, or packet broker, and it condenses all of that into rich insights, alerts, and metadata, which basically takes it from 100% traffic to 1% traffic. So it greatly reduces your ingest costs as well as your operational uh, costs for maintaining this. The other thing that we can do is uh, we can integrate this with Phantom, and I'll show that on the next slide. Now. The, the beauty about the, the Core Light with Phantom integration is this is where you can really do a lot of automation and orchestration. So think about all the rich data and insights that you can collect um, as you get uh, more of these insights uh, as, as a system is deployed, you can actually interconnect them and use our out-of-the-box playbooks, which uh, can be curated for your organization using our professional services, or you can uh, create your own playbooks, which are really, really easy to use on Splunk uh, Phantom. These playbooks allow you to automate everything so that each response uh, can be taken uh, uh, by a machine, essentially, instead of having an analyst take care of every incident response. And this really helps with the alert fatigue and allows you to focus more on the threat hunting uh, so that you can find more uh, areas that you'd like to automate so that you can continuously improve your overall SOC efficiency. So, the main items that we want to highlight are, are the following, right? Number one, we want to reduce the cost. So your mean time to detect and your mean time to respond will drastically decrease, uh, thereby reducing your overall cost of running your SOC. The second thing is we want to speed up your investigations. So by allowing you to do threat hunting and by, by allowing you to conduct your incident response much quickly, uh, you, you, will, you will greatly save uh, and, and you'll be able to focus and keep your eyeballs on the bad people. Uh, the Splunk query language combined with the Corelite metadata from Zeek uh, is the most powerful way to do this. We will also engage your entire SecOps, your threat hunting, and your incident response in a way that they've never been engaged before. Everything will be on a unified platform. All of the evidence will be available. It will be available in real time as well as historic. So you can also go back and look at many vulnerabilities that might have come up or any other things that you want to investigate uh, when it comes to network security forensics. Um, we also want to make sure that the IR team and the threat hunting team are able to do their investigations in minutes rather than weeks and months. So this is a very important point. Finally, this data can be integrated with other data sources, as uh, Luis uh, showed. So think about your endpoint data. Think about your uh, other data sources that are coming. Uh, and, and, and the beauty about this is all of this data can now be combined into one platform. And with the powerful user behavior analytics models that are available, as well as the SOAR uh, playbooks, everything can be automated uh, as the maturity level grows. All right, it's time for the demo. So I'll pass it over to Farhan. Thank you so much, Basil. Let me make myself presenter and I'll just do a quick screen check. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So what I'm going to do now is show you how easy it is to get, you know, core light rich metadata into something like Splunk and how customers can leverage that to enhance their threat hunting and incident response postures. This is the core light UI where here I see this is a live box. So I see how much traffic is coming in and based on how much traffic is coming in, the port will shift the speeds. Now, once we see the traffic coming in, we convert this raw traffic into rich metadata. We are Splunk common information model compliant. We do all the user normalization ourselves, and we also maintain our key value players. And then we export this data into Splunk. Exporting data into Splunk is fairly easy. All you do is point it to the Splunk IP, define the index. If you choose the main index, it will appear in the normal universal Splunk search or if you append it with Corelite, you would have to do index equals Corelite. This is a universal forwarder built in, and all, all you have to do is enable it. As said earlier, Corelite also has packages built in uh, for our detections around behavior. 
we have packages for bitcoin for eternal safety this is a line of exploits that came out of nsa and use the microsoft vulnerability around smb we also have packages for mitre and bizarre based detections as lewis and i were talking about earlier we also have packages around encrypted traffic detections and i will show them in in splunk as to how they visualize when you reflect this data with splunk once you do all of this that is it you minimize the core screen and go directly to splunk now within splunk what we have done is we have created an app and this app is available on splunk base or you can download it directly from your splunk instance if it has internet access within the app we have six major tabs the home screen gives you all the different alerts that core light has seen uh, using either the ids or using our own detections as well we also have details around connections the details about how much data is coming in where is this data coming in from where is data going into what protocols are being used it's a very simple question which all uh, all the time we have different answers so CoreLight can easily help you understand what protocols are being seen on the wire and if there is something that you feel should not be there you can easily respond to that CoreLight also has and maintains all the top originators and top destinations as well as looking at the amount of data that is being sent out apart from connections core light has the dns log and dns is is one of my favorite logs because it's extremely important when you're doing threat hunting and incident response now within the dns log core light has your normal top queries by count but it also has top queries by count to domains that do not exist if a domain does not exist how did the user go there so you could also start an incident response right by looking at this core light also maintains the the count of the dns requests themselves so Take an example of Lewis. Lewis does eight hours a day and he probably fires around four to 500 DNS queries. If suddenly we see Lewis doing 3000 to 4000 DNS queries that might want a, a, an investigation and you might want to check why Lewis is sending so many queries. And you could also create these as alerts within Splunk so you are ahead of the curve. Corelight not only maintains the DNS request, but we also maintain the response. So we know if somebody is going to google.com, it is Google that is answering back, which is extremely critical when you're doing incident response. Corelight also maintains HTTP logs. Now I'm just picking up the few common logs. Corelight does over 70 different log types, but I'm just picking up on the common log types that we all know. Within HTTP, we look at both forward and reverse proxy traffic. Your users going to the internet, the internet talking back to your web service. Here we maintain the status code that we see. We also maintain rare host headers and rare user agents. Within the rare traffic, this is where your anomalies will lie. The beauty about Splunk is you can create any visualization that you want as long as you have data to back it up. Corelight can also give you access to understanding what kind of softwares are running within the network. So things like Apache, Linux, IIS, Firefox. If you see somebody running a very old version of uh, IE, maybe that is something that you have not allowed and you still see it in the network. Corelight can easily point that out as well. As said earlier, Corelight also maintains access into encrypted traffic. Now we start with you know, the top certificate subjects and you could flip it around as well. You could also say, instead of giving me top, give me rare. Rare is where your anomalies will lie. Rare is where your maliciousness will be. So you could flip it around as well. You could also have you know, dashboards for any self-signed certificate that was visited, uh, any validation status that failed. And you could also look into your ciphers. If you are one of those companies that hosts a lot of different websites and you want to know if all your ciphers are you know accepted they are not vulnerable and they're not obsolete instead of looking at each certificate and their ciphers you can just look at client server negotiations that core light will pick and we can easily point out and say you know what this one is using triple des maybe this is something that you don't want to use and we want to upgrade so it becomes very easy to manage ssl as well now as I said earlier, Corelight also looks into files. We have an ability to extract files from the wire. Uh, if a customer doesn't want to extract files from the wire, we can still extract all the relevant metadata that can be leveraged and used for automation. 
as Lewis was saying earlier, we maintain a list of all files, whether they are text or Java or Flash or even archives. We also maintain the protocols that are being used to download or access these files, whether they're coming from the internet or moving around in the network via SMB or FTP. Now, finally, I want to talk about the encrypted traffic collection package and our SSH inference overview. All the data that you see here is something that has been collected by our packages without doing decryption. Something like an automated password authentication, uh, a client authentication bypass exploit has been detected as well. Somebody is scanning our authentication services or are scanning our capabilities around SSH or scanning our ports. Now, CoreLite is port agnostic. Uh, it doesn't matter for CoreLite if SSH is running on 22 or 2022. We do not, we are port agnostic. So we look at a lot of different things before classifying something as SSH. We're also looking at keystrokes here. So this gives you a lot of visibility around what is happening within your interpret traffic when it concerns SSH. We maintain host keys, destinations, and within the inferences themselves, we can show you all the things that we have observed. And this is really important when you have a visibility issue within SSH itself. Now, finally, I'm just going to do a quick check. So, for example, I have, uh, let's say I took one attempt in, we have all these events over here, and you want to do some sort of incident response on those, on those events. I have these events coming from Suricata. So, let me pick this one up. So, as soon as you click on it, Splunk will go back and put this in a search and you will see all that data that is relevant to that particular event. It comes back from, from Suricata. It says, this alert was first seen in 2014, and it is updated in 2019. And this is a privilege gain or a privilege escalation based alert. This is the possible CVE, and it gives you all the other community ID that we all know about Suricata and the service it is running on. Now, in case you want to know more about this particular event, not just the alert itself, you can pick the UID up and put it in Splunk itself. And now CoreLite will come back and say, during this event, what all files, what all protocols were being used? As I explained earlier, that the UID is the information of the connection in other logs. Here we see, we see some files getting downloaded. This is a text-based file. These are the hosts. And you can also look at the hashes. Now, you can automate this. You can take the hash, go to virus total, check the hash, and, and use that as a reference. Or you can also export and extract this file and move it to a sandbox. Finally, in order for us to give you more value in the data itself, we want to enrich the information even further. And this is where external threat intelligence feeds come in. Now, CoreLite can work with open source MISP or it can work with any commercial threat intelligence feed. Here, we have a dashboard specifically for Intel-based matches that CoreLite has observed on Splunk. Here we see the source IP, the details, what is the type of indicator. So here, the Intel has matched on the email where the domain or the inform SMTP is something that is flagged. Again, you can have reputation lists of your own that can also be incorporated within CoreLite. With that said, I will now pass it on to Lewis, who will do another demo on Splunk itself. Thank you very much, Farhan. Let me take over the screen. Okay. Quick screen check, Farhan, can you see it? Yes. yes. Great. Let's try to continue with the, with the interesting stuff that Farhan was showing up. I hope you got an idea of not only of the power of Corelight telemetry, but also the powerful dashboarding and analytics that you can create with Splunk. For this demo that I'm going to do now, um, I'm going to start by going through a more manual hunting scenario so that you can get an idea on how to use Splunk to look for your threat hunting hypothesis. 
Just a quick recap of what I said during the first part of the presentation. Focusing on the attacker's TTP is a very good approach for hunting. To do that, you need to understand which TTPs might affect your business. In the slide, you see a potential approach that you can follow. For this threat hunting scenario that I will demo, um, I decided to formulate my hypothesis around APT39, an Iranian-based APT group. The reason I've chosen APT39 is just because uh, they have been very active on the news for the past few days, since apparently the US announced some sanctions uh, against them. For the purposes of our demonstration, we will assume that the adversary managed to explore a vulnerability in a web application that runs on top of Microsoft IAS and implant a web shell, which is a piece of malicious code that provides remote access and remote code execution, allowing the attackers to establish persistence in the target organization. So our focus is really to hunt and detect this web shell being used by the, by the attacker. How do we do it? How do we formulate the hypothesis? According to Maitre, one of the ways to formulate web shell hypothesis is to monitor web server suspicious process executions. And in this case, because it's a Microsoft IAS server, we know that the w3wp.exe is usually the parent process utilized for that. So by leveraging the right endpoint telemetry on the same web server, we should be able to detect these process executions. In my demo lab, I have Microsoft Sysmon enabled as the source of the endpoint telemetry. And, and, and also this Microsoft Sysmon is properly configured with a, with a known uh, uh, Sysmon modular configuration that you can see on the link in the slide. And this is configured and running in the IAS web server and sending the telemetry to Splunk. Let's start with our hunting simulation then. First thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna access the, the, the web application I was talking about running on top of Microsoft AES. And uh, I'm gonna access the, the web shell that was already implanted. This is a, a, a web shell um, that requires authentication for the hacker to be the only person using it. So what we will do, we will run some uh, commands from the web shell to do some reconnaissance, which is an initial stage of a kill chain uh, of the kill chain to collect some information and then allow the attacker to proceed with his or her objectives. So I'm going to run some reconnaissance commands now here. I'm going to run net user to get the users associated with that web server. And as you can see, I got the administrator, the administrator and the innocent user. I'm going to run dir to understand where I am at in the web server. I'm going to run ver as well to get the OS version. And I'm going to run ipconfig to get the internal IP associated with the web server. So now that we have run these commands, and because the telemetry is being sent to Splunk in real time, we can move to the Splunk um, uh, UI to detect it. I want you, if possible, to relate all the steps that I will do with the hypothesis that we have considered for this hunt. I will be narrowing my search until I find the suspicious activity that I just run. First thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna look for, uh, because it's a Microsoft server with Microsoft IAS, I'm gonna look for the Windows events only and they are stored in an index uh, uh, in Splunk, which is a, a logical data store. I'm gonna filter for the last 60 minutes because I know it was run in the last 60 minutes in this case. And the next step is, because I'm looking for uh, process executions, uh, I, I need to narrow my search in order to get only the Sysmon telemetry, which gives me the, 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 the process creation events. So now I get only the Sysmon events uh, uh, that are ingested, that were ingested by Splunk. The next step that I might want to do, because I'm, I'm looking only for the Microsoft IAS, I might want to filter just for the hosts where I know 
because I have the context of my organization where I know IES is running. In my lab environment, I only have one host, which is running Microsoft IES. In a real world scenario, you could create a list and look up a list with specific Microsoft IES services. So now I have only uh, uh, Sysmon events related with uh, my IES server. The next step that I will do, uh, if you, uh, I will focus on process executions because Sysmon gives you not only process executions, but it gives you lots of telemetry and lots of different event codes and event descriptions. So if I look on the left, on the interesting fields, I see that um, there is a field called event description that is coming from Sysmon. And because I'm looking for process executions, I can filter only for the process creation, which is, 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 is the same thing. So now I narrowed my search to only get the process executions for that specific IES host. The next step, uh, and because I know my hypothesis, is I want to know all the processes that were run where uh, the parent process was the WP, w, w3wp.exe. So again, I'm going to the extracted fields from Splunk that are provided automatically. And I'm going to look for something related with parent process execute. And here I see that there were four events run with parent process w3wp.exe. And I'm going to filter by it as well. At this stage, we can get all the processes that were executed by WP, w3wp.exe. But because I know for a fact that usually uh, the web shell attacks, uh, in the web shell attacks, the attacker uh, usually triggers the execution of PowerShell uh, or uh, the command line, I will narrow down specifically for, for those. And if you go here, on the left again, you see that there is a, a, a field called process executed with command.exe. And I'm going to filter for this specific one. Now, I already have the event that might give me the, the, the insights about the specific web shell behavior. But uh, what I can do more with Sysmon, because I'm ingesting Sysmon data, I can get the whole command line that was run by the attack. And if you look on the interesting field, the fields again, you see that all the command line commands that I've run on the web shell are provided by Sysmon as telemetry. So at this stage, if we look at these command lines uh, that were captured by Sysmon, it looks like we detected all re the reconnaissance commands executed. And that's suspicious behavior. That shouldn't happen in this IAS server. So we can confirm our hypothesis. Next step would be to immediately uh, trigger incident response to do further investigation and potentially migrate the risk, mitigate the risk of more damage across the kill chain. Now, if I want to operationalize uh, uh, my hunt, uh, I can easily create a table that can be used in the future to identify the suspicious process executions. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the command called stats to aggregate the events by specific fields. And the interesting fields that I want to get is the time where the events occurred, the host related with that event, the user related with that event as well, the event description that we already covered, the parent process executed, the parent process, so sorry, let me go back here. For some reason, you cannot see my screen. I will copy this one. So the parent, uh, uh, as I was saying, the parent process um, executed, the process uh, executed, and the command line. And I'm going to sort it by the count because I want to see the, the, the events where uh, most uh, trigger 
uh, uh, detections have happened. So as you can see now, we have a table that we can use and we can uh, uh, operationalize by creating some dashboard panels and include it in a specific threat hunting dashboards. And we see this is suspicious behavior because W3WP is executing this specific reconnaissance commands. Now, let's imagine that I didn't have the right endpoint telemetry for endpoint uh, to detect these suspicious process executions. I could also have used the network telemetry as well. And in this case, CoreLite as, as the NDR solution because it can capture the body of the HTTP POST request with the same commands. I'm not going to run this one manually. I have the search already uh, ready-made for this demo. Uh, what, what the search is doing basically, it's going to the CoreLite HTTP log, looking for POST requests that were successful for the specific web server that we're looking for. And as you can see, if we go to the post uh, body that is already provided by CoreLite, we see the same commands that were run again on the post body to confirm our hypothesis. So what I've shown you so far was a more manual approach for hunting, and I hope you have uh, understood the value of Splunk for it. Nevertheless, the good news is that Splunk also provides an app called the Splunk Security Essentials that uh, um, can give you lots of useful content and, and mapping with, with known frameworks. Splunk Security Essentials is a Splunk developed free application that shows how to leverage the Splunk Security Solutions content for different use cases. Mapping it not only to known frameworks like Mitre, but also to the kill chain. Furthermore, the, the Splunk Security Essentials allows you to uh, understand which uh, data sources you need to trigger specific content that is provided by the different security solutions. One of the key and the powerful features that Splunk Security Essentials provides is uh, the mapping with the Mitre attack framework, as I said. And uh, what this allows you to do is to validate the coverage of the MITRE if you, are, if you want to be aligned with the MITRE. So let's say you want to filter uh, by a specific threat group, as I said, the, the APT39. You can come here to the Splunk Security Essentials, do a quick filter, and it will highlight with the red flag all the, 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 the specific techniques from the MITRE tactics that this APT group is utilizing. Also, if you, if you want to understand uh, which content can you leverage based on the data sources that you already have ingested, you can filter for it as well. Let's say we want uh, to know which techniques I can detect with endpoint detection and response. I can filter for it as well. And I can include more uh, data sources in the, in the dashboard as well. As you see, uh, in green, you see the highlighted techniques that you can uh, 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 leverage out of the box detections provided by Splunk based on the endpoint detection and response telemetry. If I go to one of them, for example, the credential dumping, and I drill down to one of these, I can see, I'm going to run it again, I can see all the uh, details around the specific. Uh, credential dumping. We wait just for a minute. So we see the data source that you need for the specific detection, what the detection is doing. For example, creation of shadow copy with uh, uh, Windows uh, uh, MIC and PowerShell. You see the tactic, you see the technique, and you see the app that Splunk provides with that specific content. Also, you see if you have the data already available in Splunk, and if you are covering the specific data. If you don't have uh, uh, good here, uh, um, you will not have the data available on Splunk, but you can prioritize your log onboarding to be able to, to, to prioritize your detection mechanisms as well. This is all about the demo. I will now uh, 
go back to the slides and pass the mic to, to Baisal to proceed with the rest of the presentation. Thank you, uh, Farhan and Louis. That was really uh, insightful. Um, so just before we wrap up, uh, some very important resources that we would like to share with you. Um, so the first uh, one that we want to talk about is uh, the Threat Hunting Guide. Um, now, what I will do is I will post uh, in the chat uh, a, a link that you can use to download this. This is probably one of the most useful tools that you can, you can use uh, today, uh, whether you're using Corelight or Splunk or not. Um, it really gives you very, very good insights into the, um, the threat hunting uh, questions that you should be asking uh, when you're doing these uh, threat hunts. The second thing, uh, if we could just go to the next slide, is the uh, the uh, core light and and uh, Splunk architecture. So I'll also post a link for that. You can download that. It's a PDF. It gives you the uh, overview of what uh, the capabilities are and how the architecture is is uh, situated. Now, if you want to go a step further, I'll also post the core light Phantom uh, uh, in, uh, overview, which uh, will give you how you could uh, architect the playbooks using Corelight and Phantom. And finally, the Corelight Capture the Flag uh, link. So this is a really, really powerful um, weekly games that we have online where you'll get your own Splunk environment along with a Corelight environment, and you will be asked a whole set of questions and you'll be able to compete against your fellow uh, threat hunters from around the world. Uh, so I've just posted that link in the chat. So if you, if you have uh, some time, uh, in the next uh, uh, weeks or so, you could definitely sign up. There are different time slots that you can set up. And it's one of the most powerful ways to get playing uh, with this type of solution. There will be also live instructors, so don't fear. If it's your first time doing a CTF, there will be uh, private instructors. Thanks, Basil. The same applies for the Boss of the SOC, which is our Capture the Flag uh, Splunk event. And actually, we are running one in, on the 30th of September. And if you are really interested and committed to threat hunting, I, I strongly advise you to, to go to this uh, uh, Capture the Flag event. You will have the opportunity to play around with different data sets, with Core Light, with Endpoint Telemetry, with OT and IT Telemetry as well. And you will go through specific hunting scenarios, leveraging the different tools that Splunk provides. I Great. think, Bas, so, you will also post the link on, on the chat, right? Yep, it's already been posted. Um, actually, what we want to ask everyone to do now, if there are any questions, um, I know there's a bunch of questions that we can take, but if you have any questions for us, uh, please do put, post them in the chat or the question box, and we'll take them live as we get them. So um, I have one question here. Uh, perhaps, uh, Louis or uh, Farhan, you can take this one. Um, what are the top three use cases for Corelight and Splunk together? How is it different than using them uh, separate? So I don't know if Farhan, you want to take it? Uh, yeah, sure, I will take it. So with so Splunk being so powerful in terms of searching, as you could see Lewis doing multiple searches and how quick it was to bring the response back, with Corelight, we send a lot of data and to have a better incident response, a quick incident response, you need a platform uh, that can scale and Splunk does that. In terms of data itself, as Lewis said earlier, not all data is equal, not all telemetry is good. Corelight provides the most comprehensive security metadata along with other features like behavior analytics uh, as well as uh, IDS alerts coming from Suricata. Having them combined gives you the ability to have an excellent incident response platform, including a phenomenal threat hunting platform that you can use to look at your hypothesis and follow them to the T as well. Thank you for that, Farhan. Next question, um, will, this, uh, will there be a recording for this? Uh, uh, absolutely, so right after the webinar, there will be an email which will have the recording so that you can play this uh, at, at your uh, leisure. Um, another question, um, does the MITRE, do you have the MITRE attack framework built into the Splunk security essentials? Yes, this, this is a question, yes, a question for me. I already replied the question on the chat, but uh, yes, um, the, the answer is yes, we have MITRE attack framework built in uh, on Splunk security essentials, as I've shown in the demo. 
Uh, our uh, uh, approach is we map all the content that we provide, and we're talking about 500 out-of-the-box content pieces that come from different products, whether it is the UBA, the Phantom uh, Store Solution, or the Splunk Core and Enterprise Security. We map all that content with the Mitre Attack Framework, and we are constantly releasing in a bi-weekly basis new content so that you can try to align yourself with the Mitre and, and, and focus yourself on, on, on the most important things in your business. Thank you, Louis. Uh, I have another one here that came privately. What is the difference between open NDR and closed NDR? Farhan, you probably want to take that. Sure, sure, I'll, I'll take it. So with an open NDR, you use these extremely rich community-driven open source tools like Zeek, Suricata, and, and PCAP. Uh, and with a community-driven tool, you have access to flexibility, you have access to all these different uh, techniques and, and packages that are created by the open source. Uh, and they're always a step ahead uh, when it comes to another closed loop or a closed vendor uh, NDR. With a closed vendor NDR, you are basically tied to the vendor itself. Any dashboards that are created are created by that vendor. So you don't have the flexibility that we need today when the attacks are so sophisticated where you might want to have access to more data, access to a new package. You can't rely on a vendor to create those packages. With a community-driven ecosystem, those packages are quickly created. Let me give you an example. So there was this cigarette vulnerability or the zero logon vulnerability that came out a few weeks ago. Within a few hours, I think four hours, there was a community-driven package around that detection. And this is the power of an open NDR solution where you are always quick to respond back because the community is so large. You're not dependent on the, the researchers that are tied to a vendor. Uh, the other thing is the ecosystem itself. So with a closed vendor uh, NDR, you are tied to that particular vendor itself. You don't have the, the, the reach and the integration with other vendors or that comprehensiveness, which is provided by an open NDR. Thank you for that. Uh, one other question. Uh, can Corelight integrate with Splunk Cloud or Splunk SaaS? And what would be the advantages and disadvantages of, of leveraging uh, uh, the SaaS-based model? I think, Louis, you can take that one. Yes, so the advantages are the similar advantages that you have with any SaaS model, right? What happens with Splunk is that uh, depending on the size of the organization, you have uh, uh, sometimes a burden when it comes to the administration of the, of the platform. Um, let's say you are ingesting TBs of data, as we have some customers, we might be talking about dozens of servers that you need to manage you need to update, you need to do patch management, all that stuff related with uh, the non-interesting um, uh, uh, bits of the security business. With SaaS, what's happening is that you will be able to focus only on the interesting stuff. You ingest the data and you just use the Splunk UI to create your use cases, to perform your analytics, uh, to perform your hunts, and you don't need to focus more attention on the uh, on the non-interesting part, which is the administration, because Splunk will take care of that for you. And yes, Corelight and Splunk can be uh, integrated with each other, whether it is in a hybrid model, a cloud, a full size model, or on-prem. Thank you for that, Louis. There's another question for you, Louis. Uh, I'm not sure if the attendee can hear us, uh, but... Uh... Let's let's try to go for it. So I would like to replace my current SOC system to Splunk. How easy is it to prepare a current team to work on Splunk? To work on Splunk platform, do you need to expert to be expert in security or average experience will be enough? Very good question. First of all, um, um, if you are migrating, the good news is that we have uh, services available to uh, that support the migration from the known SIM solutions or security platforms that you already have to Splunk. So all, every, all the content that you believe you want to migrate, we will do that for you. When it comes to the uh, education and the skills you need to properly uh, use Splunk, um, if you are talking about the SIM solution, which is Splunk Enterprise Security, most of the things are already done for you. We, as I said, we have around 500 use cases provided out of the box from our different solutions, and you can leverage those straight away. 
and Splunk security research team is always releasing new content. So as long as you have the right team of analysts to know what they need to do when it comes to incident response and the, and the journey that it takes from receiving an alert and eradicating a specific uh, a malicious behavior and containing it, uh, you should be okay when it comes to managing the platform because we provide already uh, content uh, out of the box. And if you are uh, uh, concerned about being in line with the best practices, and again, I'm gonna talk about security essentials, you have with Splunk, again, out of the box content that will enable you to be aligned with the best practices, either Mitre, Killchain, or even the top 20 CIS controls. Great. Thank you. Uh, there's one more uh, question that just came in. Um, are are the logs coming from Corelights compatible in the Splunk SIM, C CIM, Common Information Model? Yes, I think uh, I can take it as well. I think Farhan mentioned that in the demo. Uh, the answer is yes. So the data that comes from uh, Corelight will be mapped to the network communication data models that we have in SIM. And uh, with that happening, you can leverage uh, all the content that we provide based on the specific data models because the, 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 the tagging is already there and the mapping between the raw event and the CIM is already there as well. The answer is yes. Great. Uh, Farhan, is, is there anything you want to add about uh, the Splunk forwarder? So um, as Lewis said, you know, as I said earlier as well, we are compliant with the, the CIM. Uh, we handle normalization. Uh, there is no need uh, for you to do, or Splunk to do any key value pair extractions. They're also done by us. And we have the universal forwarder built in, as I showed in the demo. So one of the, this is also one of the plus points because the integration is so tight, uh, it makes it very easy to ingest all this important information into Splunk. Great, thank you. All right, so I think that is pretty much it. We are slightly over the time, but we thank everyone for joining. Uh, feel free to reach out to any one of us. Uh, again, you will be getting an email with uh, the recording, so feel free to watch that at your leisure. And if you have any further questions or if you'd like to speak to one of our experts, we are more than happy to set up a one-on-one -on -one and we will uh, uh, be uh, pleased to do that at your leisure or at the appropriate time that you have. Thank you everyone for joining and we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank this you. concludes the webinar. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the rest of your day.